once a lethal weapon of war. Like a wasp, its bright markings served warning to all sharing the skies that this was a machine of which to beware. Of the many aircraft that fought the aerial battles of the Second World War, this was arguably the most legendary, the Messerschmitt VF-109. Without question, it was the most famous Luftwaffe plane ever to take flight. It's been estimated that a staggering 35,000 109s were built, making it the most numerous fighter aircraft in history. Many say it was the best fighter of the war. All admit that it was the very cornerstone of Nazi air power. And yet, despite these incredible numbers, very few 109s survive today. In fact, only one airworthy German-built 109 remains. It's a reminder of a bygone age, an age of unprecedented turmoil, loss and bravery. Despite its German markings, this Messerschmitt was actually built by the Spanish, who still had 109s in production over 10 years after Germany's defeat. As close to timeless as any fighter can become, the 109 served Spain well into the 1960s. Still evident of the sleek, purposeful and menacing lines, once so familiar in the skies of a cowering Europe. years ago, they seemed invincible. Manned by the ablest young men of Germany, they flew to victory time and again. But by war's end, one exhausted Luftwaffe pilot would say, every time I close the canopy, I feel that I'm closing the lid of my own coffin. These armorers and mechanics are readying a pilot's aircraft for yet another mission. With three cannon and two machine guns, the 109 was a formidable weapon. Unlike Allied airmen, Luftwaffe pilots had no rotation system during the Second World War, which is why they were able to chalk up so many kills, and why so few survived. Although a tremendous camaraderie existed between them, in the air, each man was terribly alone. Fighter pilots first surfaced as a breed apart during World War I. The successes enjoyed so briefly by immortals such as Oswald Bilker and Manfred von Richthofen, the latter perhaps the most famous fighter pilot in air combat history, a legendary. The tenacious von Richthofen whose 80 kills outnumbered any ace of the war, became, like many dashing fighter pilots of the period, an internationally recognized hero. Their steeds, usually biplanes or triplanes, were primitive. Construction was crude, weapons unpredictable. Powered by an Oberosel rotary engine and lubricated with castor oil, von Richthofen's favorite mount was the Fokker DR-1 triplane. Von Richthofen's famed Flying Circus, consisting of some of the most skilled fighter pilots of the war, was an aerial killing machine without precedent. But their glory was very fleeting. On the average, the life expectancy for a fighter pilot was just six weeks. Little consideration was given to the pilot's comfort or safety. Parachutes were frowned upon as unmanly and bad for morale. Pre-flighting the machines was circumspect. In general, pilots trusted to fate and luck to bring them back alive.
Oswald Berker, who taught von Richthofen the art of aerial combat, was killed before his 26th birthday. Von Richthofen, second from the right, had been picked by Bolker as one of the first members of the Flying Circus. On September 17, 1916, the Red Baron, as he was soon to be known, scored his first victory when he sent a British pilot down in flames. Repeatedly decorated, Richthofen was later killed over British trenches and buried by enemy troops with full military honors. Among Bölker's students was another young ace who would go on to become the commander of Hitler's Luftwaffe. The cherubic pilot's name was Hermann Göring. Upon inheriting von Richthofen's command of the Flying Circus, he attempted to alter the combat philosophies laid down by Bölker. This did not endear him to the veteran pilots in the unit. However, like von Richthofen, he was awarded the Blue Max. Credited with 22 killed, Goering survived the war and during the 1920s moved into Germany's explosive political arena. Within a decade, he would ascend to a position of incredible power as part of the newly formed National Socialist regime under Adolf Hitler. During the First World War, Berger's concept of the Jaster or Aerial Pursuit Squadron was wholeheartedly put to use by a determined but outnumbered German Imperial Air Force. This Yasta of Fokker D7s, seen in 1918, represented the most advanced technology of the era. At the end of World War I, what remained of German society faced a grim and uncertain future. With its military forces decimated and its physical and political infrastructure in ruin, the German people were left with few options and little hope. But even greater disaster awaited them. Under the Treaty of Versailles, the once mighty German Wehrmacht was restricted to 100,000 men. The Prussian commanders interpreted this to mean 100,000 officers. In turn, a large clandestine army of irregulars emerged, and later also the weaponry needed to equip them. However, Germany's feeble democracy, the Weimar Republic, couldn't resuscitate the nation's anemic economy. Soon, a desperate populace fell eagerly into the hands of right-wing zealots. The Treaty of Versailles forbade Germany military aircraft. But over time, civil aviation slowly re-emerged, and several small outfits came together to form the national airline Lufthansa. By 1927, Lufthansa was looking for a new passenger plane and the Bavarian Aircraft Works, whose design team was headed by Willy Messerschmitt, submitted this 10-seater design, the Model 20. The first Model 20 crashed. Lufthansa demanded the return of its investment, driving the Bavarian company into financial ruin. For designer Willy Messerschmitt, this debacle created an opportunity. He started his own aviation company soon afterwards, but not before engaging in a heated argument with the Lufthansa director responsible for the M20's cancellation. That man was Erhard Milch, a pragmatic bureaucrat with a reputation for getting things done. Once he and Messerschmitt fought, the seeds were sown for a bitter feud that would last for decades. The M20's failure and the limitations imposed on military aviation at Versailles channeled Messerschmitt's energies towards smaller civilian planes. This is the M21, notable for its swing wing function for storage. It was just one of the many novel ideas that earned Messerschmitt a reputation for innovative design. In 1932, the Nazi party had gained control of the German Reichstag. And Hitler immediately took up the task of appointing party members, or at least those very sympathetic to the cause, to positions of power throughout the fabric of government. Behind his immediate colleagues lay an intricate network of well-chosen followers, each placed in a key position vital to creating the new Reich. One of those men, was Erhard Milch. Remarkably, Milch was half Jewish. 
but he was given a major role in military aircraft development nonetheless. To remove any stigma of the last war's defeat, Germany's Air Force took on a new name, the Luftwaffe. But in rebuilding, its designers looked to the past. A starting point was the Faltz D-12 biplane fighter, one of the first to feature an all-metal fuselage. Before long, modernized biplane fighters filled the skies of the new Reich. Among those that symbolized the new Luftwaffe was Heinkel's HE-61. But by 1934, it too was outdated, and the search began for an even more modern fighter. One early candidate was the Arado 80, a streamlined monoplane. With an open cockpit, it was built with a fixed undercarriage, although originally planned with retractable gear. Its disadvantage was excessive weight, and it never went into production. Another contender was Focke-Wulf's 159, built with a retractable undercarriage and an enclosed cockpit. Its major feature was a parasol wing that made it more maneuverable. But this too was declined because the wing made crash landings more dangerous and reduced speed. The leading candidate for the contract was the Heinkel 112. It had a retractable undercarriage and open cockpit. But the Heinkel company fighter was basically too heavy. Moreover, its wing was both complicated and exorbitantly expensive. Over time, Heinkel tried to improve the 112 with a lighter version, and also built the model 110, which was lighter still. In the end, none of these planes got the bid. Instead, the contract went to a rank outsider, an aircraft which had been all but excluded from the competition. Because of Messerschmitt's feud with Field Marshal Milch, his company had been virtually blackballed from military projects. Even so, with quiet confidence, they'd built a single-engined light aircraft known as the Messerschmitt 108 Typhoon. With retractable landing gear, the basic layout of the 108 was clean and simple. It boasted advanced features that made it an extraordinary performer. The cockpit was roomy and fairly comfortable for the planes of the day. To prove the strength of his design, Willy Messerschmitt entered the 108 in the Around Europe race. And though it didn't come in first, its overall performance made it a real winner. Onlookers were so impressed with the plane that Milch was hard-pressed to justify his bias against Messerschmitt. In the end, Messerschmitt was allowed to submit a design for the new fighter. But a vindictive Milch made it painfully clear that even if the company won, somebody else would build the plane. Undaunted, Willy Messerschmitt accepted the challenge. Messerschmitt immediately set about refining the 108 to streamline it even more. The emphasis was on speed, because unless his new design was far superior to the Heinkel, it was certain that Milch would tip the scales against him. The resulting Messerschmitt aircraft would become an aviation legend. Labeled the 109, it was a sleek-looking monoplane with an enclosed cockpit and retractable landing gear. Moreover, it was a much easier machine to build than the complicated 112. Just as important to Messerschmitt's victory was the fact that in 1936, German intelligence learned of a British fighter with similar specifications, the Spitfire. Messerschmitt's 109 was packed with features. It was a plane that would fly to immortality in the Battle of Britain. With its narrow undercarriage, the impact of landing was borne by the fuselage and not by the wing. Its sting was indeed vicious. A cannon mounted on top of the engine that fired through the propeller hub 
made the 109 deadly accurate. The wings were light and could be taken off quickly. When laid alongside the fuselage, the aircraft took up a remarkably small amount of space, making it ideal for transportation by road or rail. The fuselage was menacing and lean, and the canopy small and restrictive. But in the late 1930s, the 109 was an aerodynamic marvel. And because it was so inexpensive to build, large numbers could be manufactured. The E and F models, and later the G, were the classic versions and took up the bulk of the production run. The 109E model, or Emile, as German flyers called her, first went into battle in the Spanish Civil War. Called the Condor Legion, some 6,000 Luftwaffe airmen aided Franco's nationalists and gained vital experience there that would serve them well in the years to come. In Spain, a new generation of Luftwaffe fighter pilots was flooded. But even though the 109 showed formidable combat prowess, the machine still had shortcomings. Gunnarad, the third-ranking fighter ace of all time, explains. The 109 was a very sensitive aircraft. It's a very tiny cockpit and with a very short stick and uh, with, a, with a problem swear with a high and narrow strut undercarriage which uh, caused for a newcomer sometimes some problems uh, when he had to the throttle for takeoff and push the stick forward to get the tail up then you had to get uh, opposite rudder immediately to uh, counter the uh, torque effect. The one thing in action uh, was, uh, you had to get used to it, you know, we had these slots in the 109, particularly against the Spitfire. When we came in a tough uh, fighting and turning the aircraft at a high speed, with high speed load on the, then the uh, wings came out just by gravity, caused stalling. And, uh, slapping the, the wing, which was a disadvantage. You know, we had this framed cockpit, and uh, furthermore, we had behind your head a uh, steel plate to protect your head. You protected your head, but you took off your vision to the back, you know? So uh, we put in, in the cockpit, uh, in the early days, a mirror. But you know, just due to the vibration of the airplane, you couldn't find anything in the mirror. And if you saw somebody in the mirror, it was about the time to be loud, you know, it was right behind you. <laughs> Although the Messerschmitt 109 had an advanced aerodynamically efficient airframe, like all proven fighters, the key to its success was its engine. And for many 109s, it was the Daimler-Benz 600. Even today, it's possible to see one of these unique power plants thanks to the hard work of the Messerschmitt restoration team at the Imperial War Museum at Duxford. Restoration team member Ian Mason explains. The engine you can see here is a Daimler-Benz DB605A engine from the Messerschmitt BF109G. The engine itself is fairly conventional in layout, uh, straightforward B12, uh, except that it's inverted. If, if, it, you, if you're used to things like um, Merlin engines, or Allison engines, or anything of that sort, they nearly all tend to be an upright V with the carburetor in the center here. Now, the Germans turned that upside down and replaced the carburetor with a fuel injection unit, which gives you a much speedier response on the engine. When you hit the throttle, you get an almost immediate response. And also, you don't have any negative G problems, which is very important, Battle of Britain time. Even by today's engineering standards, the Daimler-Benz engine was magnificent, as the team found when they had it inspected by Rolls-Royce. So they took it down to their shop and measured it and found it was right bang in the middle of these very tight tolerances. And their words to us were, for God's sake, don't damage the crankshaft because we couldn't make another one with the equipment we've got today. So obviously they uh, 
when you think they made about 100,000 of these engines, um, to keep those sort of tolerances says a lot about the German industry of the 1940s. 1939 saw the RAF with two principal fighters ready for war, each one a classic, the Hawker Hurricane and the Supermarine Spitfire. The Spitfire was the plane that would turn back Goering's Luftwaffe and would pose the greatest challenge to the 109. Both British aircraft were powered by the superb Rolls-Royce Merlin engine. The Hurricane was slow, but its superior range of 600 miles enabled it to stay in the air longer than the 109. The Spitfire, much faster and more maneuverable than its adversary, could not climb as high nor dive as steeply as the German plane. The stage was set for an air war the like of which the world had never seen. On September the 1st, 1939, Germany plunged Europe into war. Over 200 Messerschmitt Bf 109s fanned out over Poland as the spearhead of the Nazi surprise attack. Arguably the best fighter aircraft in existence, they were flown by some of the world's ablest pilots. Honed in combat over Spain, Luftwaffe flyers arrogantly swept over the Polish countryside and decimated everything in their path. Supporting the ground forces storming through Polish territory, the Luftwaffe was confronted by about 300 enemy aircraft. Many were caught on the ground, helpless against the German juggernaut. The Poles mounted a heroic defense, but it was in vain. By the time the smoke had cleared, the Polish Air Force had ceased to exist, smashed and strewn across the land it was meant to protect. The Luftwaffe lost less than 80 aircraft. The story was the same across the rest of Europe. Norway, Holland, Belgium and France were engulfed by the relentless tide of German armies. Above them was the ever-present 109, an umbrella of steel ensuring air superiority every step of the way. By June 1940, the British Expeditionary Force sent to assist the French was trapped and in desperate straits. Although the miracle at Dunkirk saved nearly 350,000 Allied troops, the price paid during the evacuation was high. 44,000 British and French soldiers were killed or captured. Above the beaches, Messerschmitt 109s had a field day. With France's defeat, Germany turned its attention to Britain. Goering vowed to bring the island nation to its knees and initiated daytime bombing raids over England. The bomber's primary escort was the 109. Told by RAF commander Hugh Dowding that, quote, the fate of generations lies in your hands, British pilots in Spitfires and Hurricanes hurled themselves against the incoming enemy. Hitler announced, I prophesy that a great empire will be destroyed. In spite of the Führer's optimism, however, the 109's weakness became painfully clear. With a cruising range of just 410 miles, pilots had only 20 minutes fighting time against the enemy. Of 12 109s returning from one mission, five barely crash-landed on French soil, and the other seven ditched in the channel. Although the British had far more hurricane fighters in service, early on RAF pilots learned to set these slower planes against enemy bombers, while the faster Spitfires kept the 109s busy, thus burning up their precious fuel. Luftwaffe ace General Dieter Hrabach flew the 109 over Britain. The Battle of Britain was more or less influenced by higher commands and we couldn't do uh, what we wanted. We were uh, ordered what to do, and that was mostly uh, escort missions uh, above and around the um, bombers. And escort work meant, especially the close escort, that 
you will lose any of the advantages of a fighter pilot, that is speed, that is altitude, and uh, even uh, the turn ability. You have to fix your speed and the altitude to the bombards. Uh, they are considerably uh, slower than uh, 109. Certainly the short-range 109s were badly handicapped as bomber escorts. But in the face of tragic losses, they held on to one distinct advantage. With a ceiling 2,000 feet higher than the Spitfires, they could dive onto unsuspecting British pilots at will. Then, when the more powerful 109F came out, the odds improved markedly in their favor. Learning from the Germans, British pilots quickly abandoned wingtip formations and flew in looser groupings for more freedom of maneuver and greater range of vision. With their limited range, Luftwaffe flyers in 109s would often venture alone over the channel to lure foolhardy RAF pilots back to waiting comrades circling near the French coast. RAF pilots flew as many as seven sorties a day. The fate of men on both sides was decided in missions where the period of actual combat seldom lasted more than 15 minutes. Collectively, these desperate brief clashes between men and their machines determined the fate of a nation. Although some German flyers considered the Spitfire more maneuverable, British pilots who flew captured emus, as Luftwaffe airmen sometimes called their 109s, judged the two a very close match. General Dieter Hrabach was more than just a pilot. He was also a trainer and mentor to the Luftwaffe flyers in his command. His job was to combine and hone man and machine to a single purpose. Each pilot had his own aircraft. If it was not available, then he could take and, and substitute. But normally he has his own aircraft. And with his own aircraft, there he had his own first mechanic, his own second mechanic. And normally, you know, we had uh, in Germany, this uh, four, uh, four aircraft, we call it uh, uh, Schwarm. These four aircraft, uh, there to this, they belong always the same man responsible for we the weapons, and uh, uh, one man who will be always the same for hydraulics. So this crew belonged together, these four aircraft, four pilots, and the uh, Mechanics on the ground, they are flying with their pilots when they, they, uh, their aircraft went away, hoping and wishing and praying for that he comes back and maybe comes back successfully. The man in this aircraft was successful. Not only was he an excellent fighter pilot, but he possessed natural leadership qualities which came to the fore during his service in Spain. Ultimately, this led to his appointment as General of Fighters. Werner Mölders was an inspiration to young pilots. Although Mölders answered only to Goering, he distanced himself from the high command, preferring instead to be with his men. This devout Catholic was not ashamed to say he often experienced fear before combat and the shock that always followed. A flyer first and a general second he did much to revive the spirit of Richthofen. But by 1941, Hitler had embarked on his fatal invasion of Russia. Returning from the Eastern Front and far from the enemy guns, Werner Mölder's transport aircraft crashed. Germany had lost one of her first true heroes of the war. The nation mourned as its general of fighters was laid to rest. But another great ace was to replace Mulders. His name was Adolf Galland. He too had flown in Spain and 94 enemy pilots had fallen to his guns. He's seen here on the extreme right. He was a very, very experienced pilot and leader in the air, which is not always identical. We have a lot of Solo pilots are great shooters, but never can lead a unit in the air. You know, they are solo pilots. Gallant was a good uh, leader. And uh, when 
Möller's got killed, he took over his uh, function as a uh, general of the fighters, and uh, he did a he did a lot of good, you know. His warning and his uh, opinion was was 41 or 42, 41 when he took over that on the long run we uh, we had to have a very strong defense force. Hitler's priority was always for attack rather than defensive aircraft. And soon there were plans for a replacement to the 109. It was the Focke-Wulf 190, known as the Butcher Bird. Some called it Germany's best all-round fighter of the war. The 190 and the 109 flew side by side in the cruel conflict that was the war on the Eastern Front. Conditions there tested man and machine to the limit. In the acid test of battle, the 190 proved itself an advance on the 109, but still many pilots preferred the older plane. In the west, armadas of bombers began to lay waste to the German heartland. Still, Hitler insisted on building offensive bombers of his own. Stalin said, no, we have to produce fighters, fighters, fighters. But they come pretty soon, and he was right. By the spring of 1944, many German aces like Rao were being transferred from the Eastern Front to face American daytime bomber groups. By now, the American Air Force had received longer range, more heavily armed and much faster fighters like the Republic P-47. For the first time, US fighters could escort their bombers deep into Germany as they hacked at the heart of the Third Reich. Now the path lay open for Allied air groups to do what Goering had sworn was impossible. Long-range bombers like the Consolidated Liberator and the Boeing B-17 were making daily tracks into Germany under heavy escort. 109 fighter pilots tensely awaited their arrival. We uh, listened to, to the radio of the 8th bomber fleet over in England, you know. When they tuned off their radios, we, had, we listened to that and we could figure out what's going on this day. And so I get the first warning and we went to 15 minutes alert and subsequently 10, 5, and Kumala said, okay, now they are approaching and their escort is in this area. Then uh, he said, okay, scramble. Stemming this tide of the enemy bombing campaign posed the greatest challenge to Luftwaffe pilots since the war began. 109s and 190s flooded west. But in spite of their efforts, German civilians would die by the hundreds of thousands in Allied bombing attacks. The Luftwaffe now had the defenders' advantage. American pilots were airborne for hours by the time their German adversaries got the order to scramble. Along the way, they'd endured flak, engine failure, and mounting fear of what lay ahead. And we marched down, and then we got uh, in the north of Frankfurt, we got Tally Hoover, so I'm coming, and I got down in a group of P-47. And I got one right here from planes, and the next one. And then they jumped on me. And this was, knowing now, this was Habzemke's uh, wolf pack. And he pulled away, and his second element, or four, they jumped to me, and I was chased by these four P-47s. And when I pulled off about the treetop, when my thumb was shut off, and here was shut, and burning fire, and what the hell, I said, that's it, we get out of this. <laughs> His first loss after 275 kills reflected years of steady combat. Ironically, Rao's wounds may well have saved his life. One by one, often with over 500 missions behind them, time, luck and death caught up with the Luftwaffe's greatest aces. Between January and April 1944, more than a thousand Luftwaffe fighter pilots were lost. 
But Allied airmen were paid in kind. In 1943 alone, nearly a third of US bomber crews never made it to the end of their rotation of 25 missions. By war's end, American escorts returning from missions did enormous damage to targets of all kinds. The ferocity of 8th Air Force fighters made many Luftwaffe bases simply untenable. Prowling American fighters became so numerous that the larger airfields had literally to be abandoned. A shell of the proud force that had vanquished all of Europe. Luftwaffe groups resorted to hiding their aircraft in nearby forests. From these makeshift bases, 109 pilots flew on, now with the certainty that the war was lost. Luftwaffe airmen were the only arm of protection left to Germany's urban population. Erhard Milch warned that without them, the enemy will be able to play football with the German people. This knowledge steeled them to fight to the bitter end. By the closing months of the conflict, this 1934 design was already 11 years old. The 109s and the men who flew them soldiered on in the face of overwhelming odds. Luftwaffe flyers were often outnumbered by as much as eight to one. And once showered with prestige, fine automobiles and the status of heroes, now they were just weary and numb. I took over the 52 wing in uh, November 1942, when it had about uh, 4,000 uh, air victories. And I left it two years later, in October, 1944, and it had more than 10,000 air victories. Part one with the greatest number of uh, air victories, Barkon, Batz, uh, um, Rall, Steinhoff, Oblaser, and I could not, they all have uh, more than 150 guys. Uh, and that was a success. I have had excellent men in command positions. Parts and fuel became desperately scarce, but the 109 held up well under primitive conditions. Its engine was rugged and its airframe sturdy. Even the narrow track landing gear eventually proved as robust as the rest of the aircraft. The Luftwaffe's greatest aces logged the majority of their kills flying the 109. Even admitting that many reached their amazing totals fighting inferior aircraft on the Eastern Front, they dwarfed the numbers compiled by Allied aces, which seldom topped 30 kills. Thousands upon thousands of Luftwaffe pilots flew their last missions in the 109, and the kill marks on the sides of Allied fighters were mute testimony to their final seconds in the cause of Germany's defense. Compared with the Americans, who uh, normally had a uh, tour of uh, 50 missions, and then they went home, and maybe they got a second tour, we, the Germans, had to fly until the war ended, or we were killed. As Nazi Germany collapsed, the air war came rapidly and unceremoniously to an end. By January of 1945, fewer than 1,000 109s were left. By war's end, less than 500 were in any condition to fly. The Allies captured some 109s during the war and maintained them for experimentation and propaganda purposes. Parts were easily adapted for the aircraft and pilots learned to fly them by simply firing up and taking off. And when we had two 109s and two Bach Wolves to fly, and as soon as they were ready, I put myself on the top of the list. And my first flight was in the 109. And he, uh, I remember I took off and climbed out, and um, 
after I, I got airborne, I had a, a P-51. One of our other pilots joined me. And so we went off and we made a, a comparison. And um, the, uh, the 109, uh, it did, um, I thought, very well. And I liked the handling characteristics, other than the elevator forces. Uh, rudder forces were great, but the elevator was a, was a, a bit more in comparison with a Spitfire or a P-51. But on landing, uh, you know, we were all concerned about the narrow gear, but really uh, it uh, posed no real problem on landing. The 109, uh, uh, other than the visibility of the canopy, which every pilot would comment on, uh, was really a comfortable fighter airplane. Today, only a few survive. Some of those are actually Spanish-built Hispano models. Ironically, powered by Rolls-Royce Merlin engines, they differ from their German-built counterparts, sporting redefined cowlings and four-bladed propellers. The originals are few and far between, and they're considered precious additions to museum collections around the world. monument to Willie Messerschmitt, they're pampered and cared for like children by the men who look after them. Each reflects hundreds of hours of work on machines that in that day inspired both fear and respect. The gentle attention given them so curiously and diametrically opposed to the violent nature of their old purpose. Painstakingly restored, every piece is part of a mosaic that embodies a past age. An age when the 109 was sent to protect German bombers in their efforts to destroy the spirit and the body of the British people. By the end of the war, roles were reversed as the 109 desperately fought to halt Allied bombers. In this it failed. Nearly half a million civilians died in the reign of bombs. Field Marshal Milch lamented, that the only raw material that cannot be restored is human blood. By the time the 109s had fired their last shot and finally succumbed to defeat, nearly 160,000 British and American airmen and an undetermined number of German flyers had lost their lives high over the fields and cities of Europe.